What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest, episode 206 at block height 612,234 on Friday, January 10th, 2020. So, Janine Nopara, what's going on today? Well, still in darkness. Well, if you lived in in the right time zone, Janine, that wouldn't be a problem. I believe I'm in the right time zone. <laughs> Wait, what? What is? The, what do you think is the right time zone? America. America is not time zone. America has many time zones. America is the time. Americans don't know that. <laughs> oh shit! I made an American joke. Why <gasps> Americans were listening? Answer. Deploying <laughs> drones now. Too soon? Yeah, okay, too soon. Well, uh, yeah, I guess you want to kind of just dive into it. Uh, the first story is not really any citations or anything, just kind of a a thing that happened that we'll talk about. So I guess, Janine, you want to you tell us what that, that thing was? Yeah, so... I guess you you will have some editing work to be done. Okay, I am back now. All right, so there's the thing that happened to talk about. What was that thing? Yes, and that thing which people have been talking about pretty much every day for the past week is that a bunch of people decided to launch a journal or i would call it more of a blog because i i don't know i when i hear journal i think of long form posts but they explicitly have one of their rules that um the posts need to be as short as possible so it's more of a blog not a journal but anyway this journal that they set up is uh called nakamoto now uh f- I think that was probably the main reason why it was so, so, well. No, that I don't know if that was the main reason, but I think I mean the I think the main reason why I have a bit of a problem with it is because they call themselves Nakamoto, and I just feel like in this space when you use Satoshi's name, it's like it's a very touchy subject because you're you're kind of you're taking advantage of the fact that it's a well-known name and that it has credibility attached to it. And I I just don't think it's a good idea. I don't I don't really I don't I don't like when people do that. But the main reason why uh this journal ended up being contentious is because if you go to their list of contributors, which I will do very quickly if I'm able to, Uh, damn it. Well, I was not able to do I was not able to do that quickly. What can it be? Um I was not able to do that quickly, but um if you go to the list of contributors, some of the main people involved are, for example, Vitalik Buterin and Zuko Wilcox and a bunch of Coinbase people and some guy from Ripple. 
Um, sure, there was also, uh, I, I haven't checked recently if he's still involved, but um, there was also Elizabeth Stark and Jameson Lopp and Tour de Meester. Tour de Meester has since left. He's no longer a contributor. Um, so there was a few Bitcoin people, but the rest, I, I either don't know who they are or they seem very Coinbase, Ethereum token focused people for the most part. And when they announced the launch of the journal, they had this statement where they said that the contributors are pro BTC and that it underpins, you know, their their mission or their focus. And yet, uh, well, at least from what I saw in Zuko's post, um, it was mostly about how Bitcoin is deficient and Zcash is going to win because uh, because ZK snarks. So that's a bit of a conflict. Um, so I just, I'm just a bit confused. Like, if you want to do a, like, I don't, I don't understand why these people, like, who are clearly like 80, 70 to eighty percent are their main focus is not Bitcoin. They're not working on Bitcoin. They're not dealing with Bitcoin. They are often involved in consensus disputes in a way that a lot of people don't agree with. They make decisions in their companies that have negative impacts on Bitcoin. I don't know why they felt the need to say that they're pro Bitcoin when there's, you know, there's tons of journals, well, not tons, but there's a number of journals and media sites out there and blogs that they just generally cover cryptocurrency stuff and they don't say that they mainly focus on Bitcoin or that they're pro Bitcoin or whatever. So I feel like I feel like that statement was unnecessary because it wasn't really true. Like the the guy who is in heavily involved in Ripple is not going to be pro Bitcoin. Like sorry, you can't. <laughs> That's not really a thing. Um, they are complete opposites. And if if the stuff that you're writing about is to promote other coins over Bitcoin, I don't know. I just, I feel like it's a bit weird because we also have, um, I think we also have the Nakamoto Institute, which they've just generally been collecting papers and research about Bitcoin over the years. And that makes sense be t for them to use Nakamoto at least because they have the Bitcoin white paper on their website and they 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 f focus on a narrow set of documents to publish. They don't look at other cryptocurrencies really as far as I've seen. So, I just I don't get I don't get what their goal is. I don't understand like if they just want to get together and put their faces on a website, yay us, credibility, influential influential people. That's fine. I don't. I don't care. People can do that if they want to, but I don't. Their their approach really confuses me. So I'm I'm not really interested at this point. I might read individual people, but as a quote journal, I'm not really into it at this point. Yeah. Um. Th this is just the exact same kind of manipulative horseshit like coinbase's education nonsense but i think it shows a big shift here in that all of these shit coiners realized that if they do not closely and tightly intertwine themselves to bitcoin associatively then they're just going to fade off into obscurity so like the, the, this to me, I think is the final like acknowledgement from them that Bitcoin isn't going anywhere. And if, if they want to try and keep pulling their scammy horse shit, then they have to be seen as part of Bitcoin. You can always take the bright side of everything, Shinobi. It's their final acknowledgement of Bitcoin. That's a nice way to put it. But it's like, it, it's going to become like a, a a big cesspool of of people just going there and sucking down this fucking shitcoin garbage propaganda and then running off into the space and spouting that as gospel uh, it, it's just like 
the, the only thing I've read so far is Brian Armstrong's piece on the next decade. And that's actually why I, I spazzed out and wrote that, that massive medium article and just kind of started like a block digest blog without talking to you guys is it was just the most inane, empty, fucking fluffy horse shit without actually saying anything like just empty bullshit and metaphors like more people more businesses privacy it's it's https versus http which linked in nicely with the the bullshit zcash article on there um so it's you can already see in this first wave of articles it's it's just being used to fucking equivocate horse shit with actually reasoned positions or arguments Vitalik is a pretty good writer. He could be a teacher. I think he could make a career out of that. If he stopped teaching bullshit. Yeah, I mean, anyone can go back to the basics and explain it. Yeah, I, okay. I, I just checked the contributor list again, and they have, they have Kathleen Brightman and Arthur Brightman from Tezos. So I'm just like, guys, I'm this... This is not a credible list. <laughs> like I would be embarrassed to be listed on on a journal with these two as co-contributors. That's just no, it's not happening. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it's like it's it's ridiculous. Like th th this is clearly just them realizing that attacking Bitcoin did not give them the position to try and set a narrative. So they're trying to associate with Bitcoin positively to try and set the narrative. I mean, like the, the, this piece from Armstrong is just like the most vague horse shit ever. Like scalability. Uh, we can stack protocols, um, something, something like modems turned into DSL. Or, or privacy like he literally makes the like he literally links to the zcash article with this horse shit https uh, versus http comparison between zcash and bitcoin in his little paragraph on privacy like th it's just vague empty horse shit like it's literally the same type of content that those mind reader con men like create. They just like start off with the vaguest, most vacuous nonsense possible. And then you say something and then they narrow it a little bit based on what you say. And they just do that over and over again until they're, they're telling you exactly what you want to hear, but not really saying anything. Yeah, and the other thing, I haven't, when I looked at their website, I didn't find anything about, like, because the, the description of it, he keeps saying we, like, we were launching Nakamoto, we want to build Nakamoto into a real community, and it's like, but who is we? Like, is did all of these contributors, like, just, did they all communicate with each other and, like, let's do this? No. Or is there a company that's running this? Oh, like, no, no, no. they don't make that clear anywhere. I don't know who's actually organizing this so it's Balaji. like it, it's well like that the, figures he's the first person listed in the contributors list but i mean it's like look at tour pulling out i mean like he had no clue who else was contributing what this really was like the information he was given when he was approached was completely vague and i guarantee you that that's how they approached all of the Bitcoiners involved, like just completely vague. It's just like, get the Bitcoiners here to legitimize this. Yeah. Again, I just like, you know, the, the Bitcoiners who are in the list that I would actually read their stuff. I, you know, they're listed there. It doesn't bother me that they're listed there, but I just, if it was me, I would be embarrassed to be on this list. So I hope they get off of it as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, I just I I don't I don't get what this is. This doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, it's it's just yeah. Um the, the, this is why I just started that that digest blog and why I hope 
we can all actually get on a, a similar page and really try to build that out because it's like, oh, this is just going to be nothing but bullshit. Like, I, yeah, like, you know, like you said, like Lop, like, I, I, I don't think he'll write bullshit, but like almost everything on this, this page is going to be just bullshit. You cut off. Lies. Okay. You didn't cut off for me. But yeah, it's, it's, it's like that there needs to be a counterweight to horse shit like this. There, there needs to be many counterweights. Let's get, let's get Nick Sabo, Adam Beck, and David Chalm in a room and make them write an article for us. How about that? I think you'd have better luck herding cats. <laughs> All right. So I guess we want to slide along or any more input on yeah, this? Yeah, All right. Well, just a, not really much here, just a quick update, but Yahoo Finance uh, pushed out an article on the 5th of January. Um, pretty much somebody checked uh, T... Hold on. Tianya Cha? It, it, it's whatever. It's a, like a, a, le- a public uh, legal database um, about corporations in China. But as of January 2nd, um, Jihan Wu is no longer listed as the legal representative of Bitmain. Um, Liu Yai uh, Li, uh, pretty much uh, it's, it's Bitmain's uh, chief financial officer since 2018, um, is now listed as the legal representative of the company. And, you know, after the, this kind of coup happened, McCree uh, Zan did say he was going to file a, a lawsuit and attempt to invalidate the, the shareholder decision that put Jihan in control of the company again. And so while I haven't seen anything as far as any court proceedings or any specific information, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that Jihan has been removed as the legal rep of Bitmain. So something happened and he's no longer steering the ship. So, I mean, this kind of calls into question some of the things that he's done uh, since this coup took off. I mean, you know, I forget which episode it was, like always, but we, we talked a while ago about the, the new services Bitmain was offering in terms of um, actually allowing customers to buy put options, like hedge the, the cost of their hardware. Um, the kinds of arrangements they were trying to make um, with mining farms as far as profit sharing that's a, a little more granular depending on market conditions. And so, you know, now that Jihan has been removed, are are they going to continue with that? Like, it, are, is the company going to stay the course with those new types of products and offerings or are, are those going to get pulled um, as offerings now that Jihan is no longer pretty much running the company you know something interesting that cobra bitcoin tweeted one year ago that uh, 2019 will be about bitcoin changing proof of work and then someone retweeted it that wow how stupid cobra bitcoin is because how could he think something like that but if you think about it, back in the context of 2019, it was the context was that, wow, Bitmain is taking over everything and we might really have to change the pole or something. And, and so why, why Jihan is removed? Because now it's, it's somewhat unimaginable that Bitmain taking over Bitcoin, but one year ago, they were really that big and they had their hands in everything. So I, I think they were not not satisfied, <laughs> to say the least, with, with what uh, Jihan, how Jihan handled the company in that past year of going down and down and down. Am I cut off? Uh, no, sorry, I, I had to uh, grab something real quick. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's. I still think it's kind of. It remains to be seen what happens with Bitmain. I mean, they've got wrecked, 
in the last two years since the market's come down from the all-time high. And that was exacerbated by their whole gamble on Bcash. But I mean, like they've they've still expanded out, um, you know, and actually followed through with all the mining farms that they've been trying to build outside of China. They're still operating on the market. And, you know, again, it's up in the air whether they stick with it. But those financial services they were offering in order to kind of let their customers hedge a lot of risk is a very attractive thing for miners. So, like, there is still very much the possibility they kind of pull things out of the fire from here. You know, their largest business is mining, and there were really, there is really no, not much room to grow from there because, well, there is 25 Bitcoin in every 10 minutes. There was, now it's going down and down. The fees are not going up that much just yet. Uh, so maybe it's not even a, they were in the largest act actor in a market where it is undesirable to be you know that that might be the reason why 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 it's it's happening why they are going down and they did not succeed to diversify they diversified in a lot of things but not in terms of revenue they gained influence they launched their wallet but not making revenue like uh, selling mining equipment or mining which is making less and less. Yeah, but that's kind of where, you know, what they've done over the last two kind of comes in. That's like all the things adding up together has been them doing that actual diversification. Like they're running farms now, establishing like deals with, with town or local governments and electricity providers on electricity rates. They sell the equipment. Like they're creating all these ways for miners to hedge financial risk directly through them. Like they fucked up diversifying during the bull market, but they've actually been keeping at it during this bear market. I, I and, wouldn't call that I wouldn't call that diversifying because those things that you just mentioned, those were still involved in mining, which is like the mining market, like everything around that. Yeah, but there are things in the mining market that allow you to shift your risk around and manage it way better. So, you know, like, I mean, yeah, like if, if we don't start going up sometime in the near term, yeah, they could still wind up getting wrecked and going bankrupt, but there's still a chance that they pull things out of the fire and really restructure the company to kind of move into the next like phase of things. But yeah, I guess, um, I don't know. You kind of want to move into the next one and, uh, explain some massive data changes that were noticed since the last episode. Yes. Just one more thing to this one that, uh, I think what Bitmain is doing is uh, similar to if with Wasabi we would launch a VPN company, All right? That's a, well, that's a still in privacy-ish thing, but uh, nothing compared to, to what we are doing right now, you know? Anyway, exactly. so Bit, Bitcoin core tour nodes well, it turns out one night, January 2nd, 2000 Bitcoin Core Node appeared on bitnodes.com, bitnodes.earn.com, out of nothing. And the usual number of Bitcoin Tor nodes were always about 100 to 200, and 2000 appeared just one night and well some people were panicking somewhat including me maybe <laughs> and what it turns out it was a bit node bug that they were actually not monitoring all the tour nodes so if you look at the 
number of nodes right now around 12,000 or something like that. A lot of them are Tor nodes that Bitnode uh, recognizes. So I think that's pretty nice. So it was a bug in Bitnode. Uh, there was one thing that I did not quite uh, understand because Jameson Lope pointed to a, <clears throat> to a bug fix on GitHub and I did not look into the exact content of, of the bug fix but it happened but, but yeah the comment was fixing tours tour stuff and but it happened after the tour node jump after two days after the tour node jump so um, I'm not quite sure what was the actual fix but but uh, bit nodes wrote on their site that that they actually fixed the tour tour stuff so that's that's verified that that's what happened ah. so there was pretty much just a massive amount of nodes on tour that weren't getting crawled properly because bit nodes uh sucks yeah and imagine maybe maybe they didn't fix it properly maybe there are more tour nodes than uh that's an interesting thing to think about. So, Jeannie, were you were you trying to say something, or did did the computer get attacked by a kitty? Uh, I was not trying to say something, but also a kitty did not attack it. Damn it! Why do why do your kitties never do anything interesting when we're recording? Because this is not the zoomy hour. Damn it! How about yours? Yeah, where's your cat entertainment? Hiding. I don't have a rambunctious fun kitty. One that would that's that's super skittish and hides from everything. But yeah. Guess we wanna jump along into the next one. Yeah, sure. I'm finished talking about your long term relationship. Brown on there. Alright. So once again, uh Bitcoin magazine has published an article. Uh Colin Harper this time and at least the the core thing I think that should have been the entire article is mentioned in the title this time but um you know anybody who regularly pays attention to mining metrics has noticed you know a big shift in pools um over the last year or so but also just a big increase in pools that either aren't identifiable or that uh, specific block explorers aren't recognizing um, properly. And, you know, there's actually kind of something going on in China potentially. Um, so a pretty much in a, a North American mining pool um, is speculating, looking at the, this big kind of shift in, in things and a lot more anonymous miners as the hash rates have been increasing, that there are a lot of um, kind of special private pools um, offered as a service by bigger mining pools in China. So like, you know, imagine, you know, Ant Pool has the, the pool you connect to at Ant Pool. It's like, feeding you blocks where the coin base is marked mined by ant pool but then ant pool also operates you know private pools that don't mark the coin base uh for larger miners to connect to and kind of mine more anonymously and really i think that that theory either makes sense on its face or part of it does in the sense that even if pools are not offering this as a service, I, I do think that a lot more large mining operations are looking towards mining blocks, not publicly identifying where they're from or necessarily to pools that are publicly open or accessible to anybody. And I think that this is really just going to be a trend over the next 10 years where that's just how it works in the long term. As we start to get to the point where smaller and smaller mining operations just aren't really profitable or competitive, like all of the, these pools are just going to start becoming more closed clubs 
you know, less willing to, to sign in a block. Hey, this was mined by this group. And, you know, that's going to be a big shift in terms of trying to actually look at the publicly available metrics for the mining sector and actually drawing useful information out of that. And so I think, you know, this is something we need to start thinking about as we go forward. Mining and how decentralized that is, how that, that process works is a very important part of the system and ensuring it works properly is vital to keeping it functioning. But I think that those metrics are going to become more and more opaque as we go forward. Well, it's Bitcoin has designed. Miner anonymity should be something that, well, <clears throat> that is something that's guaranteed but miners chose to expose themselves uh, but uh, maybe in the future they choose to not expose who they are i think that's fine yeah i know it's just kind of like a like a be aware you know people trying to work on improvements in like mining protocols or how that's coordinated uh you might not be able to really measure whether what you built was effective and what you wanted it to do as easily. You know, this is, you know, just on a social issue, the whole narrative of mining centralization. Um, we're not going to necessarily be able to fight that with like very accurate public data anymore. Because how do we know which blocks were mined by which miners? Like, unless they tell us, we don't. Yeah, that's kind of a flaw design in Bitcoin, isn't it? <laughs> I wouldn't call it a design flaw. It's just how it is. And, you know, that's something everybody needs to really think about and consider how do we handle that and kind of deal with that going forward. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, unless Janine has any inputs, jump into the next big thing. So there's been a lot of activity as far as Bitcoin mining um, even a lot of people loosely tied to state organizations talking about Russia itself as a state directly buying Bitcoin. But this is a, is a, a, this is a moment here um, that, that, that's going to, we're going to look back at this and this is going to be a very important pivot moment. Uh, a state operated nuclear power plant. Uh, the Rosatom State Atomic or Energy Corporation is the, the entity in charge of it. Uh, that's 200 miles northwest of Moscow. Uh, built a 30 megawatt facility uh, that cost around five million dollars, specifically to host um, Bitcoin mining equipment. And they are planning on expanding that to something like 240 megawatts of power that they will build these centers on site right by the power plants to host mining equipment uh, out of the, the total power output that this uh, state company manages in Russia. Uh, so this is, you know, not Russia or the, the Russian government mining themselves, but this is a state owned power company building hosting facilities for mining equipment right by their power plants. So they, they haven't taken the jump to actually mining themselves, uh, but, but they're, they're literally, here's the place to come park it. We'll sell you the electricity. And that's literally the, the logic behind it uh, from the, this company's point of view is it's a predictable, steady demand for electricity. And like, you know, th this, this right here, I think is going to be remembered as the thing that kicked off big governments getting involved in mining and pushed us down the road pretty much of a, a superpower mining race. Because if, if Russia is, is looking into it like this, doing this, China's already in the position to do it and just kind of go, this is okay instead of the, the hinting they want to fuck with it like they've been doing the past couple of years and America is going to want to do it. 
And th- that, if, if that really kicks off at scale, that is a snowball that you are never going to stop. You know, the rhetoric in the American media was the Chinese miners, the Chinese miners. Now it's going to be the Russian miners. And to the Russians, it'll be the American miners. Like, I'm, I'm dead serious, Nopara. Like, this right here is, is, is the event that is guaranteeing we are going to see national superpowers get heavily involved in, in the mining ecosystem. Like, that's happening. If Bitcoin survives, that's happening. You there? Yes, I'm here. Did you hear when I started to speak? Uh, no. Hmm. Yeah, because it disconnected anyway. <clears throat> what I wanted to say is that uh, that the American media was always kept saying that oh, these are the Chinese miners, the Chinese miners. Now it's going to be the Russian miners who's going to hack our elections. <laughs> it's a uh, you know, it's in- interesting. It's going to be interesting to see that uh, if the same people speak, well, if Russians really take so where the mining power, like, I don't know, like 30% or something like that, then are going to the same people who were against the Chinese going to speak up against the Russians? Well, it doesn't matter. Like, there's nothing you can do about it, Nopar. That's the point. Like, we're we're past the point uh, a proof of work change. It's not happening. So, if if this happens, then China's gonna encourage it there. We're gonna have to encourage it here. Europe is gonna want to. India, like, it'll it will kick off a domino where if you want to remain economically relevant as a as a, a superpower or try to become one then you have to keep up and competing um, in Bitcoin mining. Like not, and, and it doesn't even have to be like the state itself is mining. Just you have to compete in making sure miners are in your nation. Do you agree in that there is a point when proof of work can happen? What do you mean proof of work can happen? Change, proof of work change. No. So if... Russia gets sixty percent of the hash power. This this mining firm only this, so no chance. No, I think I think maybe, maybe at you know large scale. That. <laughs> no, it's like maybe we could soft fork a second proof of work on top, and require that to keep current miners in check with more distributed miners, but it'll, it'll specialize just like the last one. And pulling that off as a global money would be a a long period of economic chaos as people duped that out and decided to go with that soft fork or not. And the chain splitting, like, no, we're like, we're there. If Bitcoin is worth trillions of dollars. You have superpowers getting involved in mining like that. Like you, good luck. You're not convincing anybody the, who's not a, a, an ideologue to to fork away from that. That all the value is there. What if 100 percent that one facility takes over 100 percent of the Bitcoin mining? Would proof of work change happen then? No. I think, dude, if we're at that point, you know what would happen? An airstrike on some of those mining farms. Like by the time Bitcoin is that big that it's it's worth trillions of dollars, you have all the superpowers involved in mining like that. Like you, good luck changing anything. It's not happening. Like that's where all the network effect is. The the value is like it's not happening. You can't even get all the people in a single city to agree on everything. How are you going to do that across the entire planet? Well, we were able to do that when uh, there was the Micron bug in 2013. Luke Jr. Luke Gier said that, okay, guys, we are going to roll back to the previous version. And we did. It was Agreement an insignificant, tiny thing. 
Like that was an insignificant tiny thing, dude. It was worth nothing at the time. The amount of people you needed to convince was nobody. They were all available through a few chat rooms. That's not how it works. If Bitcoin is a tr- is a multi trillion dollar global asset that every superpower is using, you just have to say, okay, the next Bitcoin core version, half a year from dude, now. Dude, no part. It's not no, dude. You that you are living in a fantasy land possible. if you think that that would work when Bitcoin is worth trillions of dollars and used all over the world. You are in a fantasy land if you think that would work. Nobody would download that. Nobody would take that risk. Okay. All right. Well, I guess next up, uh, what is next up? Janine, you are up with, I hope, something that goes in a positive direction. Yeah, so if you guys didn't know, um, there's been an ongoing petition for Ross Ulbricht to receive clemency on his multi-lifelong conviction, and he's been in prison since he got that conviction. Uh, I think this this was his seventh Christmas uh, in prison, Um, so... That petition has been going on for a while, and it I don't know exactly which day it reached this point, but I think it was sometime over the holiday break. Um, the petition reached 260,000 signatures, which, um, if I recall correctly, I think Chelsea Manning's clemency petition got a um, hundred thousand or somewhere over a hundred thousand and that was a really big deal and she ended up getting clemency in I think it was 2017 no yeah I think it was announced sometime in 2017 um with no wasn't wait was it I yeah I think it was early 2017 um yeah so the fact that he's gotten that many signatures is someone is going to have to look at it at some point um because it seems like there's a lot of support behind it uh hopefully uh they're obviously pushing towards like 300,000 signatures so um if you have i if you haven't uh checked it out and added your name um and you want to support him i would recommend doing that Mm-hmm. It's only for Americans, right? Yeah. But it's like, you know, it's, I don't know. A pardon is really the only chance he has. And I think after an election, like, there's an actual chance Trump might just do it and just not give a shit if he pisses people off. Because what what does he have to lose at this point? Well, so just to clarify, um... A pardon would be a lot harder to get than clemency. Clemency just means that your sentence is either shortened um, to the point of you you are released, or it's shortened in remaining duration. Whereas a pardon, you're actually saying that you're you're basically overturning the conviction. You you have no criminal record, which I I that's I see no chance of a pardon happening, which is why they're going for clemency instead. Um, because just, just get him out of there. I mean, like he's seven years, like that. That's long enough for what he actually did. Well, I mean, if you ask some people, it's too long for what he did. But yeah, um, I mean, I still, I don't. I mean, I don't know if any president that we're going to have in the next couple of years is going to care. Um. So I I I think that it's going to be the case where people are just going to have to stand up and shout about it and it's just going to be like they have no other option because there's so much pressure um which you know getting this many signatures should be enough pressure I don't think anyone in the White House gives a shit about these people I think that that pressure will continue building like I I don't know how you have a photographic memory for every fucking episode we talked about everything, but 
I, a while ago, I, I brought up um, some attention that that petition was getting. And it's is literally a mainstream conservative Christian was getting infuriated at what happened to Taras when he actually looked into the case specifics and what happened and what the defense was not allowed to do and what the prosecutor did. Like the, the, the problem here is getting past the whitewashing. Like once you get past the whitewashing, the most normal people in the fucking country would get furious over what happened to him. You, you just need to break through that wall. Oh, man. Yeah, so the I don't think I mentioned uh, the link. If you go at the petition, um, you cut out. Do, 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 do. All right, let's try that again. So I don't think I mentioned the link. If you want to sign the petition, if you haven't already, you can find that at uh, freegross.org/petition. Due to Shinobi forgetting to add a story to the news desk, we recorded it after the episode and awkwardly spliced it in here. Alright, so... Why did $15 million of Tether get liquidated on the Ethereum network and move over to Liquid? Um, Because Ethereum is going to die. (laughs) <laughs> they're managing risk <laughs> well i mean it's this is just this is really interesting because i've been waiting for this to happen since the the like the actual contractor well not contract just token on liquid um for tether was made a while back and it's it's, it's not it's, i mean it's it's nothing compared to the two billion dollars of tether floating around uh on ethereum right now but it's it's not nothing either i mean this is gonna be really interesting like there is now fiat like stable coin token on a chain with confidential transactions um like how is that gonna go <laughs> Like, you know, I think, I think like two years ago or something, um, I, I just saw Elaine, um, who post about it on Twitter, um, again recently, like there was actually a decent amount of tether just being used, um, between like Chinese and, and Russian companies, um, to actually pay for goods and services, uh, being moved across the borders there. It's like a, a USD stable coin on a confidential transactions blockchain. Um, it's like this is it's like it's going to be a big move and a very useful thing for traders and exchanges. But like that's going to come with some interesting other sides of that if this move uh, snowballs to much larger amounts. So explain and- this to me. Liquid is BTC pegged, so how is that stable then? Well, no, it's you can issue other tokens oh. on on Liquid, and so the like Tether just issues a Tether token, and you use that too. But why Liquid? Why not Bitcoin then? Because Liquid has confidential transactions, faster block times, quicker you know, recognition from exchanges for deposits and withdrawals. So it's for technical reasons, they think it's more suitable, like they actually think confidential transactions is a good thing and things like that. In the context of trading markets, yes. Um, Because without that, it's like you, you see this all the time. Like how often do you see like these alert bots and stuff go some whale sent a massive amount of crypto to an I exchange see, and then people front run, you know what I mean? Yes. So it's like this, yeah. I mean, yeah, right. you, you were trying to say something though a second ago, Jimmy. Yeah, I was just going to point out the fact that like it's interesting that this stable coin is going to be on a network that has confidential transactions because as far as I've seen stable coins have been the opposite of like using any privacy technology. 
I don't know if that has any effect on Tether as a token, but still interesting. Well, assuming the actual first issuance happens um, out in the open transparently, and then the you know discrete log assumption holds for range proofs, I mean, it's still auditable. I mean, you just don't see it. But yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting. Jarring transition. All right. So next up, I guess something a little, a little cooler and more fun and less depressing to talk about. Um, so Grubles posted on Twitter a retweet of Gotenna posting on Twitter a design file for a drone mount for a Gotenna. So that you can Ooh. actually put the, the GoTenna node on a drone and keep it airborne. And ooey, this this got my head fucking spinning. Uh I, I have already been obsessed with the idea of where is it legal to hang or like tether balloons that go to very high altitudes um places. Just because you, you can you can really in an urban environment uh double or triple. The range of these things which get a lot shorter with with all the buildings and interference around and like make wider coverage areas that way like this this would be a, a perfect way to do this and i mean it, you know this is a, a little further down the, the line type thing but i could totally see a little landing pad system that just has a couple drones on it and drone attaches to the gotenna flies up and stays there and when the uh the signal or the the yeah, when the drone's battery is getting low blasts out a message i'll be right back drops down gives it to another drone and starts charging and goes back up or like shit you could even if you want to be really discreet about that like you could have lines of communication like that that like only pop up at like certain times of night when it's dark outside so nobody really sees it like go up high enough that nobody really hears it it's not visible and like you know you you could really take low bandwidth mesh networks to a whole crazy new level where when you start talking like put put the the, the mesh node on a fucking drone really Really? Well, I mean, I already said I'm on board, and I think that's awesome. I just wanted to mention that that uh, audio tweaker wrote in the chat that how many previous presidents, how many pardons they give, give and they they did a lot. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> the the point of the list, I think, is to show that in comparison, uh, the current orange-haired uh, president has given the least amount of pardons <laughs> by a significant amount. Yeah, that's that's right. Well, fuck orange man, drone internet, drone internet. Like, like the, the, this type of shit could seriously be here in five years. Like, the, the, there's already, like, re kind of pricey, like, landing platforms and, and, and types of drones that literally you, it's just got a platform it drops on and wirelessly charges. Like, the, the amount of steps to, to grab things already out there that are improving and just plug them together and equal mesh network drone mesh network like dude th this this is fucking amazing like this uh, could be you know a transaction propagation network a fucking lightning routing layer a if you you take this to the extreme like you could have mining farms using compact blocks spitting headers out and obscuring where they're actually located at least from network traffic fingerprints like we we could be we could be actually building that type of shit and deploying it in like five years. I I just got an assassination market type image in my head. 
<laughs> like people tipping a drone, their local drone to like defend them or something. Okay, I don't want to start this line of conversation because it contains information hazards. <laughs> it does? Yes. Okay, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Well, si well, since the country of our origin is currently uh, in the business of assassinating people, I don't think it's off of the... I don't think it's too far off the path. I'm going to get myself in trouble. Let's move on. <laughs> move along. I'm on Have the drones lists. go in the opposite direction. I'm on enough lists. All right. So, uh, not too long ago, the latest version of Sea Lightning launched with AMP support. Uh, well, LND 0.9 hit a beta release, which, boom! brings AMP support to LND, um, as well as a lot of other cool stuff. Um, so they've also released a macaroon bakery, um, so you can kind of fine tune um, a macaroon access permissions to a lightning node. And for, for those who don't know what the hell a macaroon is, um, it, it's kind of like a cookie, um, except a lot more granular in the permissions you can do and you, you can do things like make a macaroon that has the authority to like make more macaroons itself but it but those cannot do anything more than the original one could and and things like that it, it, it's a nice extensible you know access control mechanism for interfacing with apis and um yeah so there's a lot more stuff you can play around with that um they've implemented a um custom metadata record um that can be included in um the the core of a onion routed payment now um but that does kind of have some trade-offs in that uh, if you, the more data you shove into this kind of custom record, the less space there is for route hints um, and instructions. So <clears throat> the more you shove in there, um, the shorter route you're actually capable of taking. Also, they officially implemented the uh, key send functionality that lets you make a payment uh, to a node without getting an invoice first by hiding the pre-image in that last onion packet that the recipient would get. Um, what else? They've also implemented, this is really fucking cool, um, circular rebalancing um, by paying yourself. So you can now rebalance your own channels without having to interact with anything external to your node. You can just have channel A of yours pay some to channel B, however you want to handle that. Um, they've also um, issue, er, no, hold on, uh, fixed an issue with the uh, entropy um, that seeds the, the headers for Sphinx packets um, that could potentially have uh, this is, this is kind of bad. I uh, could have let the recipient figure out how many hops a payment traveled down. Um, as well, um, some pretty awesome extensions regarding funding. So they've started opening up uh, and refactored the uh, funding transaction workflow um, to start moving towards PSBT so that you can do the the same kind of functionality c lightning has where a wallet outside of the lightning node actually funds the uh the channel um as well as you know some pathfinding improvements and rpc uh refactorings and such but i think you know the the core awesome fucking things here are being able to rebalance your own channels uh amp finally hitting there key send and you know i i really think that you know the the more that people can play around with macaroons when it comes to to interacting with lightning nodes i think a lot of interesting weird things are gonna gonna pop out of that no no thought 
No, sorry, I couldn't catch any of that because the baby was distracting me. Damn, baby! Best excuse. Yeah, so, um, you know, I know, I know I've been ranting a lot about the, the shit Sea Lightning has been doing lately, and R&D's finally really catching up. Maybe it'll tear ahead. Maybe. When I Maybe. last looked at it, it wasn't ready. Did you know I wanted to build Wasabi on top of LND? Wait, what? Yeah, because they had the Neutrino client, right? But things started oh. just... You couldn't even get out a private key of the toilet, but I guess it improved a lot since then. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking mostly about the functionality available. Like, I... I think I've been very clear in all the times like lightning implementation stuff's come up. I think C lightning has made a way better choice in terms of architecture, but like just, just in terms of the features that the, the software has, I think L and D is finally like catching up and, you know, maybe they do blow ahead in that way, but I, that doesn't magically make the architecture like C lightnings, you know what I mean? Wait, uh, is C Lightning is on top of Bitcoin Core? I mean, all of them just their own implementation. I just like you know LND. Like, there's a lot of modular API access and stuff, but like C Lightning really took the modularization to a crazy level. Like, things are broken up into their own daemons with tight access controls between them. Their whole plugin architecture that lets you really customize uh, low-level behavior into just like a simple RPC call through the plugin. Like it's, I, I think Sea Lightning is going to wind up being a fucking beast in the long term, especially with like big backbone infrastructure. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It does have to be big backbone infrastructure. In fact... If you if you have a great API, then you're going to attract more developers who are working on consumer facing applications. I think large large companies can actually tolerate the shitty APIs more because they can actually change stuff. Usually they have the influence or the resources to change stuff in the shitty APIs, right? With Sea Lightning, they won't have to, though. So, but, but again, uh, is, I don't remember. Is Sea Lightning is based on Bitcoin Core? No, they're all completely from scratch. Uh-huh. Yeah. But I don't is know, I can't get... Lightning wallet, Lightning node... Is there any implementation that's based on Bitcoin Core? There is no anything based on Bitcoin Core and Lightning. Like it just plugs in on top, and it's all from scratch. Why is that? Because why, why, why the hell would you rip out all the mess from Core that's intertwined in validation shit and refactor mm -hmm. that? No, sorry, that's not uh, what I meant. I meant, why isn't any Lightning implementation building on Bitcoin Core's RPC API, right? Oh, I mean, dude, they all do. Like, they all plug into Core through that. But it's like, I'm saying their own API and RPC for, like, all the Lightning functionality. Oh, okay. But yeah, speaking of... uh. Lightning infrastructure and such, though. Um, dude, like, Shared Bits, this company is killing it. Um, so they've started a, a new uh, blog post called Lightning uh, 201. And um, it's kind of looking at Lightning infrastructure <clears throat> and issues, um, exchanges, and, and things like that would have to run into. And so they've worked out um, a, a kind of a redundancy um, uptime guarantee, pulling out the the node's database essentially, 
and having that in a remote location um, separated from the actual node. And so the, the two issues that come up here um, in terms of problems is something not being written to the database um, because of network issues or multiple nodes um, trying to access the database and leading to one of them doing something with an old state that pretty much gets your, your funds taken in a penalty transaction. And so they've actually implemented on Eclair a um, system to keep the database locked, um, not just at an entry level, but at like an actual node level. So you would pretty much have like a the, the database in its own separate server and could have backup nodes with all of the, the node keys and information. And <clears throat> one of them would register, I'm using the database right now. And this is the first thing that happens when the node calls the database. And then only that node can use the database for, um, they, they configured it for five minutes, but it, it can be variably configured. And then that node has to keep renewing that, that kind of credential every five minutes um, to prevent any other of the duplicate nodes from accessing the database at the same time. And this way, you know, that this kind of lock here is that's how much downtime you would have if the, the node that's using it crashes or fails or whatever, and you switch over to a new one. Um, but the, the whole system, it's, it's just a nice simple setup so that you can have backup nodes, redundant things with the, the same node key, the same channel keys so that they can keep everything up once they switch over uh, without running into any of the big fuck ups that can happen with a lot of things digging into the same database. And, you know, this is a real simple thing. You know, it's not, whoa, crypto magic, but it's like that this just setting up the, this system to do this is going to be a massive improvement in utility going forward in terms of big like core lightning nodes that need to be up all the time because they're important backbone nodes. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there was a question a couple of months ago in a conference from me about how do we endure to not lose data, uh, something like that and on the lightning network and my answer was it just software engineering you know so well it looks like they are doing this software engineering mm -hmm. so that's nice i mean it's just, it's just perfect like you just have a remote database the the node does not actually take any action on the lightning network until it makes sure that got recorded in the database and a credential system so only one can talk to the database at a time and boom you could have 12 different copies of a, a lightning node up and just switch over to the next one if anything happens and it's it's like this is the exact like simple kind of shit needed to really make this work why don't we just why don't we just uh, put our put all our Bitcoin wallet information to Google Drive that synchronizes automatically with, <laughs> with the server. <laughs> you know what? That's brilliant! We don't need any of this stupid software engineering. Let's just use Google. Google Drive. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's like, you know what I mean? It's, it's like a, a normie... Bitcoiner is going to look at this and be like, so what? But it's like, this is a huge necessary thing for Lightning to actually be global, dependable infrastructure. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess uh, that's, that's you for the last one, you need. Yeah, so as you uh, may have seen, uh, if you've been uh, looking at Twitter at all today, people were celebrating the fact that, um, well, they celebrate this every year, but today is January 10th, um, and well, it was January 10th in the American time zone, as <laughs> Shinobi called it, um, 
But on January 10th, 2009, uh, Hal Finney tweeted running Bitcoin, and um, it's suspected that he was one of the first, if not the first other person to run the Bitcoin software um, besides Satoshi Nakamoto, assuming Satoshi was the first. Um, so that's pretty cool. It's been uh, 11 years now since that tweet, and... Uh, uh, 2020, so it's also special. So here's to, here's to the next 10 years of pe uh, people replying to Hal Finney's tweet every year <laughs> around this time. Satoshi wasn't the first. It was the artificial intelligence hiding on his computer that tricked him into thinking he was a person in a chat room that put the idea for Bitcoin in his head. Okay, so it, it so it wasn't an alien that works for the NSA. No, it was artificial intelligence created by the NSA. Boo. Have you heard this term, half finning? Yep. There is this girl. I don't know if it's girl, but uh, anyway, her name on Twitter is Pocket Dev. Kamina drummer. Oh my god. I thought. <laughs> that person is just a, a lunatic moron. Like, that's simple. <laughs> yeah, so he or she coined the term that Hal Finning, uh, at least that's in his Twitter uh, bio. Oh, uh, yeah, the term means that the ne then the halvenings should be called halvenings, right? Dude, because that like Pocket Dev is like the third or fourth person to just start screaming and calling Rodolfo a scammer because they can like totally break the open dime security, bro, and then just start blocking people when they call them out uh, as being full of shit and ask for a proof of concept. I don't know. I I I actually found his. He tweets at least the replies to mine that quite uh, insightful and not not basic. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, I guess final thoughts. Who's gonna go first? Uh. So I have a thought. Go. Um. So there was a. I think it was Michael Folkson. He tweeted about the fact that the BBC. Um, tech section had published an article titled Make a Will and it was about um, people dealing with the fact that when you die um, a lot of people who own Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies haven't uh, been very thorough or um, thorough or thoughtful about um, how others uh, might recover their Bitcoin in the event that something happens to them. Uh, the disappointing part, though, is that there is literally a book uh, about this, um, Crypto, Crypto Asset Inheritance Planning, um, by Pamela Morgan. And, of course, the BBC did not mention it whatsoever, which is annoying because literally that is that is her topic and she's written a lot about it and she's published a lot of material so the fact that that they completely ignored it is annoying so please pester them to not be stupid although it is the bbc so i don't have that much uh faith in that happening yeah what about you no par i have nothing to hide okay i, I mean nothing to say but Kind of means the same thing, right? <laughs> you have nothing to hide but your chains. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess uh, my final thought is, uh, so after, after like years of people I know rambling, I have to look into this Roku's Basilisk fucking thought experiment. I did. And it's the stupidest fucking incoherent nonsensical retarded meme i've ever heard in my life i hereby declare you stupid imaginary basilisk ai that i exist for the sole purpose of guaranteeing your stupid ass does not exist suck it see you later punks
are we supposed to say? Yeah, you need to have a voice for your head. Yeah, you need to have a voice for your head. Yeah, you need to have a voice for your head.